Um, yeah, there's only a few of us at the moment. There may be more who join. Uh, we will have some sort of small group uh, discussions, probably just two groups, given the numbers so far, uh, as we go in. I've got a lot of uh, PowerPoint slides just to help guide what I want to say. And uh, feel free to uh, chip in at any point. Uh, I may not be able to see you that well when the slides are up, but just uh, shout out. And if you have anything to say, I'm very happy to transition into discussion at any point uh, on time. It's not a, we don't have to get through everything as long as we have good discussions and I learned something and everyone else learned something. That's the main, the main uh, intention of the session. Yeah. And Dita, if you need to leave and go to sleep, early please feel free i love the way you hold space i love spending time with you but i know it's late so just putting that out there all right i've got some slides here we go so i'm going to talk to for the next you know hour and a half or so about indigenous perspectives on decolonial futures. So we'll talk about colonization, decolonization, and also some indigenous philosophies and perspectives and life ways and views and that how that relates to the decolonial and colonial aspects of the world. It's, uh, yeah, it's pretty confronting stuff. But there's lots of um, food for thought, hopefully. And um, I've got suggestions at the end for other things you can read in more deeply into the sort of topics if you're interested. So I'll start with a uh, acknowledgement of country, which is something that we do around here in my part of the world. Acknowledge the Wurundjeri peoples of the Kulin Nation as the traditional custodians of the land that I'm on, unceded land, land that was never sold or given away to colonizers, but was taken nonetheless. And I pay my respects to the elders, past, present, and future, and any other Indigenous peoples who are with us on the call. And I also honour Bunjil, the great ancestor, creator of the Kulin Nations, as one of the creation uh, yeah, beings of mythology. Just a question about recordings. Yeah, yep, we can. I think we're recording so we can circulate more broadly. Yeah, including to people here. So a little bit about me to start with. A uh, bit of racial identity stuff. Um, I'm an Anglo-Asian Aboriginal Australian, mostly just like all the A's. But that uh, being Aboriginal is part of my identity. That's important to me and probably one of the more important aspects in this particular discussion, but there may be others. And um, so I'm Aboriginal through my mother's line and my grandmother was a member of what we call the stolen generations around here in Australia, which is just one of the many aspects of colonisation that we're about assimilating Indigenous people and destroying our cultures and um, really trying to breed us out and uh, help us die out uh, so that we weren't a, any of a, a pest to the colonial powers. But unfortunately, that didn't happen for them. And that's why we're here talking about this sort of stuff. So uh, my mob are the Wakaya people. I'll show you a map in the next slide. Um, I was born in the north and raised in the north of Australia, and, but now I live in the southern parts of Australia in Melbourne and have for a while, since 2007. This is a map. Uh, I'll show you the, the bigger map in a second. But this is a map that's used often uh, in Australia to talk about um, the variety and diversity of Aboriginal groups, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander groups that were in this country before colonisation about 500 groups. And this is my mob here, the Wakaya people um, from the north of Australia. This is the, the bigger map. It's lots of different colors, which indicate what really bioregions um, uh, and also tribal groups, which very much overlap because as Aboriginal people, we very much understood the environment and lived in regions um, that had a certain environmental cohesion to them. Okay, um, 
now it's a time for a little exercise about you. Um, going to break into some small groups, probably quite small, two or three. And um, I just want you to say something about yourself. Um, a little bit to do with what I introduced and how I introduced myself. Touch on topics of, of race or ancestry, if you will, and place and time. And um, just, you know, resonate off each other. It's just like a, a one or two minute introduction to a couple of other people touching on some of these topics of race, place and time. And then um, whoever goes first, another person will link in with what they said in some way um, in introducing themselves. Let's talk about colonization now. Yeah? All right, this is a map of all of the countries that were invaded in the world at some time by Britain. Not the ones in white. Wow. Yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> <laughs> seriously? Yeah, seriously. Yeah. And um, not to pick on Britain, this is the European uh, version of the map. All the green stuff colonized by Europe and then there's sort of partial influence and actual Europe in purple. And, you know, there's, uh, it's a similar map, basically. Um, so this is the problem that we're dealing with. It's um, people don't always understand the scope of it, but yeah, it's when you look at it, when you map it on, on the world, it's uh, it becomes a little bit clearer. And one of the biggest issues with that is, is that it's very monocultural when you do that, when you, when you try and impose a certain culture on the whole world, you know, it's like a big agriculture. It's monocultures are, are, are really not very good for, the earth and they're not good for the for the people who eat that food and it's the same with cultures you need a diversity of cultures that's one problem of course there's the destructive um, elements of of um of colonizing cultures as well the fact of colonizing is makes it quite destructive as well as the monoculturalism so let's talk about that history a little bit so just a quick overview of modernity as i call it um, yes, Japan is a mixed story. Just responding to some comments here. Um, definitely heavily influenced by Europe and European culture, but not officially colonized. So 15th century onwards, modernity. So these are some of the key features for me of modernity. Private property. This was a big one. Created by the violent enclosure of peasant lands of peasants in throughout Europe. From, from about that time onwards, a bit a little earlier in some cases. Then of course, the actual, what we consider to be colonization, which is all the um, you know, stealing and, and, and death and destruction on indigenous territories around the world, outside of Europe and, and, and Asia, and sort of into the new world and Australia and those sorts of places. Um, there's some great books about this. The witch hunts were a very important part of modernity, not often mentioned, um, which was, very much a ratcheting up of patriarchy and a destruction of um, feminist uh, traditions that happened during this time as well. And then, of course, we have the Industrial Revolution and uh, the invention of wage labour a little later on, only 150 years ago or so that became more important, which led to very much this intensification of um, extraction and control, production, distribution and exchange controlled by wealthy elites and therefore the extraction and, the, and, and we're getting to that point now where we have eight people in the world who own more wealth than half the world's population. So that's the end result of that intensification through industrialization. What are the dominant norms of modernity? I call it modernity. It's kind of like Western culture, but there's reasons why it's better to call it something else. So here are some of the dominant norms. So we have rationalism, uh, mind body dualism, that's important, um, and sort of a, a privileging of the rational in many cases. Um, time perceived as a linear quantity that can be saved, spent as a commodity that can be saved, spent, performed to, wasted, but also linear. 
it, it flows in one direction from one place to the other. That's a very specific view of time that's not shared by many um, cultures in the world. An action orientation, which is very much about sort of um, individualism, um, individual power to will power, I guess, to create your own fate. It's um, once again, there's different ways of looking at that in other cultures, um, much more embedded contextual ways of looking at that. Universalism, a kind of sort of um, uh, a progress, I guess, progress towards uh, one truth or, or a certain perfection or um, development. It's all got a very, um, it's not a, a very diverse idea of, of where societies can go. Competition is also huge, of course, and, um, and the ideas of merit and, and, and deservedness, uh, worthiness based on, on some of these concepts of, of competition in particular. So here's a little analysis exercise. Uh, these are slogans from uh, Fortune 500 companies, the biggest in terms of monetary size of uh, companies in the United States, um, and therefore some of the biggest in the world. Um, what are the, tell me, what do you take as an archaeologist from the future? What do you take as the underlying values of this society? You found this, you've uncovered this, these slogans as you dig in the dirt of this uh, civilization that um, went extinct some hundreds of years ago. What do you take from these slogans as their values? Competition, yep. English, yeah. Yeah, they definitely had a language that was dominant. A future-oriented focus. Yes. Yep. Control. And, and control, control, control. Acquisition, right? And... Mm. Mm. Yeah, there's a lot going on. Um, definitely something about risk as well. Yeah, the, about uh, the pace. It's about yeah. speed. Instant gratification too in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A sense of privilege too. Yes, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> There's a lot going on there, yeah, and some interesting, right. um, mostly words, but some interesting images as well to, uh, in here. Yeah, so that's an example. Um, next slide. Uh, so just some, some facts about modernity now, I guess. So, um, you know, colonialism is an ongoing process. That's important to remember. It's still happening. It's still there's still parts of the world that haven't been uh, destroyed or brought under control um, under that sort of privileged arrogance of defining the future. There's more going on. But also, you know, we know that 60% of the world earns less than $5 a day. Eight men are wealthier than half the world's population. 1.6 billion people are without adequate housing. Um, there might only be seven men now or six men. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Just responding to a comment there. No women so far, which is not surprising. And a quarter of children worldwide are malnourished. These are the sort of facts of modernity. And um, I guess, you know, then we have the environmental impacts. We've seen with COVID a, a, a sort of intensification of um, securitization. It was already a trend, but it's intensified. We're in the middle of the sixth mass extinction. We have catastrophic climate change. And then we have all these biodiversity targets which go whooshing by that the UN created that you know no one's met any of them in the last 20 years. So I heard recently that Greenpeace is trying to broker a um, ocean treaties that will protect um, supposedly protect 30% of the oceans or something. But you know, um, I have to say uh, I'm quite cynical about pieces of paper that um, leaders. Um, create with writing on them. They don't seem to result in much. 
Speaking of that, we have nation states, which are a very important part of modernity, um, relatively new in their, in their modern form, but certainly a trend that's developed over several thousand years in terms of um, an initial chiefdoms and proto-states and those sort of things. These days are very well developed. Almost the entire earth is claimed by, Nathan, by nation states. Not all of it, but 99%. And um, they're maintained by debt, by property, private property, by institutions, by labor, coercion, or otherwise known as tax collection. And there's various rights that are part of being in a nation state within a country, like Australia, for example, or any other country. And those are enforced by legal, legal violence, legalized forms of violence that the nation state, one of the defining features of a nation state is that they have the monopoly on, on violence from their perspective. Uh, my view is that nations are very dangerous and they are part of the problem. And the reason why we have colonization is this, this, this drive to expand, um, to colonize, to have, you know, colonies like Australia was a colony and still is, um, a, um, you know, a colony of, of England in some ways. So the claim that only nation states can protect us from each other through law and order is just a justification for oppression and exploitation. That's my view. There's some great books about that. I recommend later. Here's a big slide with a lot of stuff. Um, we'll go through briefly. So there's a modern promise and then there's the colonial process by which that occurs. So we have capitalism, the promise of growth and wealth accumulation, which is driven by exploitation of humans and non-humans. So slave labor, which continues all around the world in various forms within developed nations. We have wage slavery as it's called, but there's much worse forms in, in what are called third world countries often or the global South. A lot of animals and life uh, suffer for that growth as well. Nation states, I mentioned security, property, cohesion, national identity, but really a lot of state violence in the form of policing. So either policing within borders or policing borders themselves so that people, the, the movement of people is controlled very much across nation state borders. Uh, we talked about universal reason already. Uh, it's a problem that we don't really acknowledge other not systems of, of understanding enough. And there's a lot of them out there, but we have a kind of um, focus on science and these sorts of things. Um, as truth. Hierarchy, uh, status, upward of social mobility, uh, this idea of, you know, socioeconomic status and a kind of worthiness that's, there's a lot of, um, a lot of judgment and comparison and, and, and even condemn that condemnation in, in, our, in our modern societies about who's worthy and who's not comes out through in many ways, including, you know, um, who deserves unemployment benefits and all these sorts of things. Um, extractive human centrism. So yeah, just this idea that there's a lot of natural resources for us to exploit uh, and that creates the climate change disaster that we're in. And many of these problems are underpinned by our idea of separability, the idea that we are actually independent, individual, separate, autonom completely autonomous, unrestricted autonomy. And that denies the really the deep interdependence and relationality that we have with, uh, and therefore a sort of accountability or responsibility that we have to the whole web of life that we are very much a part of and deeply embedded in and dependent on, or at least interdependent with, not independent of. And just a nice graphic. Um, this all comes from the Decolonial Futures, gesturing towards Decolonial Futures um, website. I should mention all of these slides I, I will pass on um, to Dida to pass on to you. And they have some notes sections which have references and, and sources for this, um, these graphics and other things. So there's the everything is awesome perspective. And um, I have to share with you that I've been um, hanging out at various events recently and I feel like there's a very powerful propaganda machine that's kicking into high gear at the moment. Uh, a lot of young people are starting conversations with me with this, this, this view that the world that we have now is the best that it's ever been. That's what they tell me. This is the best that it's ever been. And then we spend a lot of time talking about that because 
I mean, I'm not sure if there's a statement that I would agree with less than that statement. Uh, and this this slide tries to sort of capture that that sense of everything is awesome, which is what a lot of people still think. Um, you know, people in Africa have mobile phones and washing machines. We have science, democracy, rights, education, modern medicine. We live longer. Well, actually, life expectancy has been dropping in in the Western countries recently, but we used to live longer. Um, we've never been happier, healthier, wealthier. This is kind of one perspective. And then the rest of the slide is the other perspective. Um, austerity, structural adjustments, economic instability, massive arms trade, unaffordable healthcare, forced migration, um, obviously climate change, people who can't afford, you know, young people who can't afford to buy houses anymore, that's too expensive in some parts of the world, like where I live. Um, jobs that aren't there, massive um, depression, epidemics, loneliness, these sorts of things. So it very much depends on your, your perspective. But what I'm trying to suggest is that we need to really dig deeper than the everything is awesome um, approach, which I have, yeah, I have been hearing quite a lot recently. Okay, so this is another point of small group discussion. So this, there's a YouTube video basically, um, which what I'm going to do is I'm going to send you the link on the, in, in the chat and I'm going to do that breakout room thing again. Just watch this thing. It's a few minutes long. There's no sound. It's just a, a visuals with some questions. Feel free to pause it at any point. You can watch it through and then go back or you can just stop. And I just want you to discuss the questions that they ask with these beautiful images uh, alongside them in your small groups. That's basically. Um, so moving on from that exercise on guiding, gesturing towards decolonial futures, guiding questions, I'm going to uh, share screen again. And hopefully I'm in the right place. Yes. All right, a few more slides coming up. So here's my take on decolonial perspectives. This is, um, we're getting into some of the stuff that I've, uh, this will be unreferenced because it's sort of, it's my stuff that I have uh, pulled together. Some of the slides, if you notice a lack of um, sources, that's, that's, that'll be why. So my view of decolonial perspectives is, is this basically, nothing is complete, perfect or enduring, but all is alive, sentient, profoundly relational and deeply sacred. So the importance of that really is from an indigenous perspective, which is partly where I'm coming from with a lot of this work is, um, you know, we live in, we're in, the, we, we are within and part of a living cosmos. And so everything is alive and sentient. It's all, it's very hard to separate one thing from the next. One of the dangers of Western thinking is, is thingification, as, as it's sometimes called, making the world into things. So if you want to have things, you have to realize that those things are not complete. They're never going to be perfect. There's no such thing as perfect and they're not enduring. They're, they're impermanent, um, ephemeral. But also everything's related. And to me, everything is in the, in the living cosmos is deeply sacred because it's all alive and sentient. We are immersed in unsensed worlds, which we can strive to, to sense, to inhabit, to co-mingle with and grow with. So the point being is there's always more to life than we can ever understand. You know, there's, there's unknown things and there's just unknowable things, but that's the fun in life is to, to grow in that ability to connect and relate and sense with the world. And so we're invited to outgrow the often unquestioned need to obey, conform, judge, compare, condemn, and also repress. Uh, which is really one of the defining features of, mo of modernity is that, is that conformity. It starts our ability to express, to create, to sense in two worlds, to connect and to play. And um, that's why I'm interested in this idea of wilding and wildness as a, uh, a sort of juxtaposition with the, the tameness, the, um, um, the limitations of what we call civilization as a way of of expecting people to toe the line and that sort of thing 
So I would suggest that we're called to consciousness, embodied, conscious, embodied, loving, reverent, co-liberation with each other and the living cosmos. And that's really, uh, for me, is one of the key aspects of decolonization. It's not about, it's not about what sometimes people think some sort of um, um, governmental level treaty or some sort of um, reparations and We'll talk a bit later about, about justice and my problems with justice. But yes, there's, an, there's some ideas from me on decolonial perspectives. And so how would you get to a decolonial future? Well, for me, it would be about relinquishing ideas of debt, private property. So not that you can't have possessions that you own personally, but private property is this, this unlimited ownership of, you know, the fact that we have billionaires or people who own things that they don't use that they rent out to other people for example that's to me that's an atrocity and we shouldn't have that institutions are very dangerous things created for several thousand years ago and running rampant across the globe ever since nation states also not cool in my in my view so let get rid of those things and that'll help us overcome radical alienation from ourselves, from other living beings, from our work, whatever it is that we're called to do in the world, and from so-called nature, which in Western and modern perspectives is, is somehow separate from us, when in fact we are nature and nature is us. So this means unlearning reductionism, truth in a sort of uh, universalizing singular, singular way, other ways, not so much. Truth is good in many ways, but it's got a certain ring to it in modernity that's quite dangerous. Rightness, power over, ambition, success, perfection, certainty, control, coherence, mastery, progress, virtues, even virtues can be dangerous these days, the way they're deployed in weaponized form to judge and condemn others. Validation, heroism, fame, merit, entitlement, duty, and sacrifice. All of these things, I think, are emblematic of colonialism, actually. We can talk about any of this in detail. Explore ways of becoming, relating, and perceiving that create a life beyond human exceptionalism, uh, exploitation, extraction, consumption, growth, and human hubris, which are you know, very much defining features of modern life. Um, the cycle of exploitation of the, of the environment of other people and in this sense that we are exceptional as a species but also as individuals we have a, often have a strong sense of exceptionalism as well this is a graph from the um, decolonial futures mob which we've seen already a few of their uh, their great work that they do interesting uh in this game gamified metaphor that they use so they're talking about what can be done about colonialism essentially in there they have this soft reform space this radical reform space this beyond reform space and it gets back to that idea is what at what point are people at in their journey of understanding it some people talk about it as to what extent have we woken up from the, the nightmare of colonization some people still exist in their bubbles of privilege where they actually yeah have never been happier wealthier or healthier but that bubble is always shrinking, becoming smaller, and people are falling out of it and getting quite a rude awakening from doing so. So for some people, the game is awesome. Everyone can win once we know the rules. When you move on, you realise that actually things like racism, capitalism, colonialism, heteropatriarchy, nationalism uh, are problems in the world. Yeah, You acknowledge those problems, you recognise those problems, and you start to think, well, something's wrong with this game that we're playing, the game of society. It's rigged. We need to change the rules. We need to fix it somehow. Then the beyond reform space is saying, well, actually, you can't fix it. It's not fixable. It's not a because those things, race, capital, patriarchy, they are intrinsic to modernity. They're not some sort of unfortunate byproduct. They are modernity. They are the system that we live in. And so that's the point where you, you sort of go, the game is harmful, makes us immature, we're stuck playing it. Let's, let's not, let's play another game. Let's find other modes of existence based on different cosmologies, some of which I have mentioned already. We need fundamentally to change the way we are, the being, the knowing, the doing in the world. Uh, it's not about fixing any sort of system that we have. The system is 
unfixable, but it can be um, hospiced out. At the, at the bottom here, they talk about modernity's palliative care. Um, so it's sort of a hospicing of a system that's dying out that will be replaced by something else. And what that is, is up to us to, to create, or at least to sense into as it forms and to flow with that, that unfolding and unfurling of something new. Another interesting diagram from that uh, same group. I'm gonna talk about this in a minute, justice. I'm very interested in the idea of justice, but they have mushrooms. Mushrooms are fantastic, mycelium uh, networks, and they're just talking about metabolism, metabolic well-being, how to metabolize things in the world, how do we metabolize and digest in different ways. Well, how does that relate to knowledge? How does it relate to the traumas and attachments, fears and insecurities that have uh, are really developed to a great extent in our society? And then how do we relate in different ways, ways with ourselves, with land, with each other? Recalibrating relationships, are, uh, that's a really important part of this. Um, story, we do need to relate in very different ways with every part of the living cosmos. So just a quick aside about justice, um, a lot of talk about social justice these days uh, with things like Black Lives Matter, Me Too and so forth. I worry about justice as a concept. It seems to me very colonial uh, and it seems to be about things like redress and grievance a sort of detached objective judging, even condemnation um, that leads to things like amends and redress and punishment and one truth, the sort of decision about who's right and who's wrong. So Cornell West suggested that justice uh, is what love looks like in public. I don't think so. I think healing is what love looks like in public and I would invite you to consider healing as a, a different metaphor for what we might, what we might be trying to, to inhabit and dwell within now in our lives. So healing is about making whole. It's an, it's about embodiment. It's an organic metaphor. Healing only happens to things that are alive. It's a sense of, of growth of, 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 yeah, of wholeness, of vitality, of abundance. And I think it's a very different concept to justice. And uh, I, I strive for that. Um, I try and welcome healing. And I am very suspicious of justice, even more so than I am of portals. Yes, justice and portals don't mix. They mix well, but I don't like them. <laughs> Here's a quote from Malcolm X I quite like. If you stick a knife in my back nine inches and then pull it out six inches, that's not progress. If you pull it all the way out, that's still not progress. Progress comes from healing the wound that the blow made. And they haven't even pulled the knife out, much less heal the wound. They won't even admit the knife is there. So he's talking about healing. And uh, he's not talking about justice. He probably has at other points, but in this particular quote, there seems to be something interesting happening with healing. So you could talk about healing justice if you wanted to as a combination. So an ongoing long-term relationship of care, generosity and respect rather than a once-off balancing or reparation or redress or punishment, a sort of sense that you can fix things um, at a point in time and then they're somehow sort of balanced. That's a, sort of, that's a sense I get from justice. But um, healing for me is an ongoing relationship that, you know, how long will it take to heal that wound that the blow has made? It will take much longer than, than to pull out the knife. So I just wanted to talk a bit about Indigenous perspectives now. And um, just to note that I don't think of decolonization and indigenization as exactly the same thing. I think they're related, but they're not the same. So we have this problem of colonization in the world uh, that's been developed intensely over the last 500 years in particular, but has histories going back 10,000 years. and um, to, to sort of remove that or to hospice out that system is to open up to, to an immense range of possible futures. And that's the point, the diversity of, of possibilities. Uh, some of those futures may connect with uh, the past. So what's, what Indigenous peoples around the world, all of us really, all of our ancestors did for 95% of human history, I think that would be quite 
uh, nourishing to connect with those traditions and of course existing indigenous cultures but it's not it's not necessary as such i mean decolonization is about opening up those possibilities and some of those will be completely new things that have never been done before on on the earth and that's that's wonderful too so they're not the same but they're related and um yeah just wanted to make that point and then uh let's talk a little bit about some indigenous perspectives so I presented what I thought of as decolonial perspective. Indigenous perspectives are things like this. A different approach, there's many, this is just some examples. A different approach to time. So considering time as circular, rhythmic, cyclic, um, where the future can be remembered and the past is yet to come. And the now is very thick, textured, flowing and swirling. And it's not, it's not the sort of clock dissected clock time that we have, you know, because we have clocks, and they're everywhere and they have been from the last within yeah over the last 150 years or so they've become quite a uh quite a plague on the planet the clocks um they create a they create our sense of our the way we experience time is very much impacted by that and if you can get out and uh go camping or something and not have a clock for a few days or a week or two would be better i think you'll find that things will change for you how you how you experience time will change and both holistic uh thinking and being and doing and so forth not just binary that's another part of it of, of a lot of indigenous perspectives wisdom humility respect generosity response abilities are not so that's a hyphenated word that's about your ability to respond that's what's important what can you do here in this situation how can you embody uh, humility and wisdom and respect? What's your ability to respond? And how does that work across knowing, being, and doing? And the many senses. We have so many senses that we don't engage with, we don't attend to. Combining reason, emotion, intuition, and imagination, connected embodied relationships and relationality with humans and non-humans and all of life, including the alive country that we are part of the land the sea the sky within within the living cosmos this could involve you know different approaches to knowledge and truth and understanding here's some uh particular indigenous traditions around that so knowledge as not a commodity is not an acquisition but as a process of continual integration integration is so important it's it's that ability that we have to flow across time and to to feel and embody the impacts of our, our being in the world. So what, what are the consequences unto the seventh generation of what we do, or even to someone tomorrow, even to ourselves, if we do this, how are we gonna feel about that tomorrow? How did we feel about that yesterday? So integration allows us to, in many ways, act with more of those values of compassion and courage and kindness and wisdom to integrate our experience over longer than just dissected clock time. One of the problems with modernity is it invites us to amnesia and to anesthesia, to not, not to feel and to remember, including remembering the future. And we need to, we need to feel deeply. We need to feel everything so much more. And we need to remember time in all its complexity and integrate all of that. Understanding is uh, ever always incomplete, embodied collective action. So understanding is not sort of knowledge. It's a embodied practice that's always changing. It's about experience. It's about making meaning, but it's, it's about sensing into things as well, more than just meaning. Truth is story. Stories are so important for everything. Um, in, some, in some Indigenous traditions, facts would be considered as badly told stories basically facts are, uh, are stories without any context so they're terrible they're terrible stories <laughs> and different ways of learning memory uh practices so oral traditions which 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 privilege story and song and music and dance and painting and carving and ritual ceremony country and so the place that you're that you live becomes a a, a kind of substrate for remembering uh, many things more broadly, I'd say that ritual and ceremony are very much missing from our modern societies, and we need a lot more of those. 
So I mentioned responsibility, just to say that that means, you know, attentive listening, learning and sharing. Um, as a we have, we have responsibilities as a person in a particular place about a particular issue. It's not a kind of abstract general thing. And it relates to care, you know, as, as, as a relational thing, um, as about witnessing, listening, smelling, tasting, feeling, um, and, and doing that in ethical ways. So care and responsibility are kind of really related within this ethics of co-becoming. So basically an ethics of um, understanding that we are on a journey with other people. It's a bit like that um, quite famous quote from an Aboriginal elder in Queensland that said something like, if you've come here to help me, you're wasting your time. If you've come here because you know that your liberation is bound up in mine, then let's work together. It's that real sense of entanglement, of co-becoming, of we are together and connected and related. And you don't have to help me. You just need to journey with me and we'll figure it out together. Um, this is a great, there's some great papers uh, to look up with some of this stuff um, about stories and spirals and how they work, weavings and wendings. I won't talk about that too much, but there's references if you want to read more. So some people have got themes that they've developed, um, which is really important. Taking respect seriously, relating, belonging, knowing your place, co-becoming. Sensing and attending, patience, caring and loving, that responsibility and transformation, reflection and transformation. I think that very important part of life is epiphany and revelation, which is a form of transformation. And uh, yeah, we don't, we don't um, kind of attend to that enough, sense into that uh, and, and welcome and embrace that as, as, an, as part of our our journey, I think it's um, often a shock to people and they get things like midlife crises and that sort of thing as a result. So to summarize that, uh, I guess, you know, if you wanted to be dichotomous and comparative, which is not always a good idea, uh, you could say that indigenous perspectives are about relative autonomy within, within embodied constitutive interdependent communal relationships. So autonomy is really important within indigenous perspectives, but it's relative. It's an autonomy that's kind of moves within a dense network of relationality. So you're autonomous in many ways more so than in modernity because you don't have so many rules and regulations and requirements and social expectations um, that are so tightly bound about how you should act. There's less of that in many ways in indigenous cultures, but you have to be responsible and you have to care. And, and so that means you, you act within that, in your autonomy. And you are constituted by your relationships. This is important. I think it's coming up in the last slide, but you're not in, independent at all. You, you create it through those relationships on an ongoing basis. Modernity is often about growth, order, control, exploitation a lot of the time. Um, and there are definitely hierarchies everywhere. It's quite individualistic. It's quite, in, it's quite competitive. And in that way, it's quite oppressive because people feel alone. You know, that's that one of the defining features of modernity. You are an individual, you're alone. Um, there's all this bullshit economic rationalization stuff about max, you know, profit maximizing, utility maximizing individuals. And it really is is very destructive for people's um, health. Yeah, their whole well-being is is jeopardized by this approach to life. So this is the point I was trying to make before about constitutive relation or in consti being constituted by your relations. There's a few interesting examples here, uh, but basically there's a lot of evidence, even from Western science, that we are deeply impacted by our environments, you know, um, placebo effects, nocebo effects, expectations that others have of us of performance make us perform certain ways. We are not just sort of disembodied rolling heads that are attached to bodies. You know, we're much more than our heads. Um, paying attention to the world, you can um, anticipate things uh, in ways that uh, at least modern science is just can't really grapple with. 
So some interesting recent sort of gut bacteria thinking with your gut, that sort of stuff, and the way that now we know that um, psychiatric conditions can be transferred between people when they when gut bacteria moves between people. So your psychiatric conditions can be in your gut bacteria. So basically we're not individuals at all. We're this, this sort of messy conglomeration of of what you could think of as separate living beings that form together into one, or you could just acknowledge that they always were connected anyway. So we are made up of many, many things. We are multitudes. Um, so what I'm saying is we don't have pre-existing independent thought uh, or, or even pre-existing independent existence. We actually are constituted through our environments. We're not separate. We are distributed, diffused, diffracted, ongoing events. We're kind of relational bundles or flows that sort of move through the world. And one of the key aspects of Indigenous philosophy is that relations come first. Relations are, if, if there's any fundamental basis to reality, if, and that, that itself is kind of hierarchical thinking, but if you wanted to go there, it would be relations. Things come after relations, not the other way around. Okay, I'm going to do, this is a good time to have one, this will be the last breakout room exercise, and then and there's a few more slides after to finish off. It is a very Western sort of time unit thing that we <laughs> come out of these when we're, when we're told, isn't it? <laughs> yes, it's terrible. It's terrible. You, I don't like it at all. You, you know, you could not have them on a timer, right? And just let people come back when they're ready. But yeah, I could. We might be yeah. here for three and hours or three days. Then we'd be here all day. Days. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which would never be leave. right. The colonial <laughs> structures of Zoom land. <laughs> no. I feel like it's um. Yeah, it is annoying. Uh, that's for sure. It'd be good to have open-ended. Obviously, it'd be good to do stuff like this in person and just gather by the campfire and chat for hours all night. That'd be the best thing. <laughs> yeah. well, we're in Melbourne. We could do it. <laughs> we could do it. Yeah, we could have some of these gatherings in person. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. And in fact, that's one of the things we've been... Um, keep an eye out that for the locals because here at Mora Mora we are trying to have these kind of events in person events yeah this this workshop kind of gatherings where people come together and stay overnight here for a few days so anyway if anyone's local keep an eye out for that right back to the clock time it's running out so I'm just going to go straight into the last few slides so that you know in case people actually do have things like going to sleep that they need to do or what have you. So this is the next, there's just about eight more slides. So this is the a great uh, diagram of a transition from an extractive economy to a regenerative economy. And, you know, it's getting away from colonialism, militarization, extraction, consumption. But the way that they, they the, the sort of, the primary thing here that's really important for me is this drawing down of resources of power what i call radical relocalization is really important part of decolonization we, we need we need people to be empowered at, in their local communities to make decisions about that affect them that affect their communities so nothing about us without us is one way to put it uh, so localization is really important and you know the which is deep democracy. I think that's how you actually do it, how you do participatory democracy, not representative democracy, participatory democracy, caring and sacredness, regeneration, well-being. This is a there's a great group who you can look at uh, in the in the notes about uh, this report that this comes from. And here's a quote: "Tap into the immense joy that comes from forgetting who and what we think we are, and instead sensing the gift of not only being what we imagine ourselves to be." This is part of the welding sort of stuff I'm talking about. There's something deeply ingrained. There's many things deeply ingrained with us within us that we need to to transform, really. And this is part of that is imagining something else, not just for our economies, but for ourselves. 
So um, for me, the decolonization is about radical relocalization. It's about participating and creating and fostering and nurturing community. Um, there's many ways to do that. It can be, you know, universal basic incomes, or it can be just living in intentional communities, local exchange trading schemes. But it's really about, in the end, it's about collectives and cooperatives and, and ways of people uh, not being owned by others, really. Owning your own world in the sense of being part of a world as an equal participant, not in a, a capitalist sense of ownership. There's too many people owning other people in various direct and indirect ways. So cooperatives, communities is what I'm suggesting. And, and it means cooperation. It's not about competition. It's about pleasure, frugality, simplicity, sufficiency. We, we, we create too much impact on our world. It's damaging our world. So we need to, to really be humble about that. Think global, act local. So I'm talking about a grateful, humble, ethical life that tunes in, heals, and creates radical abundance for everyone. Um, where our indicates belonging, not ownership. So belonging to being part of something. Um, yeah, our, our modern society is about is about creating artificial scarcity and also artificial demand. And that that is the foundation of the competition. But actually the world is radically abundant. There's there's plenty in the world for everybody. Yeah. So you can do that, of course, by withdrawing from the system and to some extent starving the system, um, uh, hospicing the system. But also there's direct action. A lot of friends of mine engage in direct action, which is great. You know, boycotts, embargoes, strikes, and so forth, uh, protests. Uh, these are really important as well as, as the personal choices of how you live your life. You have to you have to make a fuss really so at the very least other people can see the importance of other ways of being knowing and doing at a broader scale we have some major problems with our economy obviously we have stock markets we have labor markets we have interest we have commercial banking subsidies for rich people advertising that's a scourge on the earth one of the worst things ever invented planned obsolescence Redundant trade where thousands of tons of tomatoes are being exported while thousands of tons of tomatoes are being imported. Just complete uh, madness uh, that is known as capitalist colonialism. There's a lot to fix. And it's unfixable. So there's a lot to let go of and transform. Here's a great uh, website you can look up where they talk about process stuff. They say, well, how do you, how do you go about about transformation. And here are some suggestions. Uh, work in circles, not lines. So be involved in dialogue and inclusion, not hierarchies. Uh, be humble learners who practice deep listening. So challenge your own assumptions. Be happy with criticism. Listen deeply. Just try and be a learner as well as a sharer. Sharing of gifts with the world is really important, but learning from the gifts of others is at least as important. Plan with, design with, connect collaborate or some people now use the word co-liberate instead of collaborate which i think is quite nice not represent really important one move at the speed of trust that's just if you use that in life for all that you do you you'll make a huge difference to how people um relate to you and perceive you center lived experience and seek people at the margins because you know the margins are where all the other things like decolonialization um, and de decoloniality we live outside of the mainstream system. Okay, and so this just to finish, um, what I'm inviting people to do really is to strive for societies that value self-realization, freedom, interdependence, care, love, connection, celebration, beauty, grief, and cooperation without institutionalized exploitative hierarchies, which hoard resources produced by the labor of others. Weave networks of empowered local cooperative communities grounded in things like anarchy, degrowth, wilding, unschooling, permaculture, decolonization, myth, ritual, and ceremony to inspire authentic, creative, thriving, playful, vivid, visceral, plural, messy, vulnerable, sacred, sensuous, joyful, sensible lives. And the challenge in that invitation is many. 
many and varied. But part of it is being uncomfortable with the unknown, the unknowable, unexpected, uncertain, unthinkable, and imperceptible. Making unique mistakes, doing, feeling into what you think your next step, your action should be, what is needed beyond convenience, choice, or conviction. So really being able to sense into that. Metabolizing your assumptions, complicities, tensions, paradoxes, projections, fragility, and traumas. And then, of course, being able to discern, perceive, relate, and become. In many ways, without narrative, meaning, identity, intellectualization, and many of those modern ideas of what's important. Certainly without judgment, comparison, justification, or condemnation. You know, need getting back to that, everyone's on their own journey. Some of us are, you know, at different stages of wakefulness to what's happening, and that's just the way it is. And you know, we need to acknowledge that everyone's doing their best, but also have our own boundaries and have that humility, that compassion to try and you know journey with others that may be in a different place to us. So we need less of these things, I would say. Uh, just some, just a kind of word dump that I did one day, not long ago, of some of the things that uh, um, I don't really like about modernity. Uh, less of this stuff. And more of this stuff. Have a look later at the slides if you want. Uh, but yeah, there's, there's many aspects that we could foster and grow and cultivate and help to flourish and other things that we could let go of and help to, to reduce or vanish. Paper I wrote, more details in that of various things related to this talk, not the same stuff, but related. There's a you know, link at the bottom of the notes section, you can find that. And there's lots of books you can read if you're interested in, for example, Indigenous philosophies, Indigenous knowledges. There's some great books here, some of you may have seen already, from different parts of the world. And other books more broadly from non-Indigenous authors uh, about all sorts of amazing stuff. Imagine worlds, importance of belonging, degrowth, economic systems, more uh, kind of um, accurate histories, hopeful histories of humanity, and so forth. Grief as well, and beauty. Uh, that's it. General questions, wrap up, so forth, because we're out of time. So, over to you for some final thoughts and comments. Yeah, I mean, people who need to go, need to go, and people who can't stay, can stay. Exactly. Thank you. I really appreciated the session and your sharing and meeting everyone. I do have to go. I have to go take care of the goats and a lot of animals before it gets dark. So thank you so much. Yes, of course. Thank, thank you. you, Cheryl. Oh, yes. Bye. So I just done a mic drop at the end there, you know. A mic drop? Yeah, it's sort of, you know, when when your words kind of, it's like you're done and people just need to sit with it and it's powerful. And it's like, you know, there you go, everyone. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing more needs with. to be said, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Less of this, more of that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Thank you. Um, wow. Um, I had I had an amazing chat with uh, um, a really beautiful person from from Mexico recently, and he was talking about um, how in their communities the so that they are kind of independent to some degree from the government, uh, not officially recognized the way they do things, but in the end, uh, they've 
they solve their problems, they school their children. So very much like this invitation that you had. And one of the things that he said was crucial, two things were crucial for him. One was access to land. So that he said without, without that, there was no way that this could work. And the other one he mm. said he, that was equally important was, was their cosmology. So basically also like what you were saying that the way that they see that they are just one with everything else. Um, and that cosmology is transmitted through the elders. So they have what they call the abuelos, which are just the grandparents, but kind of the general grandparents mm. of, the, of the village, um, bringing that knowledge and that wisdom to the children. Um, and I guess me being still very much part of modernity, I'm still looking for a how, how do I bring, so I don't, I don't have those abuelos or those elders and, um, and I can, I, I was telling before in one of the small groups, I can, some of the things I can actually feel in my body somehow. And yet I feel that there is such a, there's so much I need to learn <laughs> to even start trying to grasp how can I, how can I transform myself? Um, yeah, so I don't, I don't even know if I have a question, but it's more about, is, is, there, is there a healing, is there a hope for healing of modernity? And not of the system, but of the humans that are part of it. Well, I mean, I think that healing is always possible, yeah. And um, yeah, it's not about the system; it's about the it's about the life, living living beings are, are what we care about, and um, we all have so much potential power to change and transform and grow and re reveal and have epiphanies. So yeah, every moment I think is a almost infinite potential to transform and um, uh, this the all that we do is 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 um, all the systems and the power and the nation states and the institutions are just created every day by the actions that we do mm. so if we take different actions then they they disappear they don't mm. have any existence beyond the life that supports them they're not living things they're the props mm. for living things, and we can change those. Mm. Mm. Yeah, and I, I'd like to agree with that. That's really every moment, right? If there's healing, then it's now. There are no other time for that. And uh, I have to admit, I'm feeling a bit overloaded here. I have no opportunity to heal. I'm a little bit too overloaded by knowledge and your knowledge yin which i very much appreciate i feel so enriched by your knowledge but in the process i'm feeling um i can't heal i can't heal right now with the way mm. your knowledge is brought to me and i really want to um, mm. um be part of this healing so I'm, I'm just saying yeah. that in terms of trying to learn with you the ways we need to bring in to heal in the moment with that knowledge we all have. And I, I really appreciate what you brought in today. So, and it resonates so much with the knowing I have, which is not expressed in, the, in, a, in that language or in the academic context. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Shanti. Yeah. Um, yeah, a lot of powerful shares just now. And I've, I find myself stuck on that one graphic that you had of um, hospicing modernity um, and, and palliative care for modernity. And for me, I feel like there were sort of these two phases in that palliative care section where there's like the one where it, it was like 
I know this is immature and it's not working, but I feel like I'm stuck in this. And then there's the one that says, why are we playing this game? Or shouldn't even be playing this game. And um, I find myself struggling with like one foot in either side of that line a bit. There's like this despair that's in me that I think keeps one foot on the former. And there's like this hope that keeps one foot on the other side. And, um, you know, Joy made a comment here in the chat just a little bit ago about this shift in consciousness. And I, uh, I resonate with that. I think that's happened for me personally, and I'm sort of seeing it happen in com local community as well as sort of at large. And for me, that's been the most tangible way for me to experience it is just my personal practice of uh, the inaptly name, I think, mindfulness, <laughs> um, but like the compassion and the um, becoming more aware and um, allowing more of that uncertainty and organic um, emergence and all of those things that are sort of becoming a part of how I show up in the world. And, and I do feel some hope in that, like, oh, yeah, you know, like, whoever I interact with, in a sense, I'm modeling that and maybe they're picking up on some of that. And there's a ripple effect from that. Um, yeah. But yeah. I think the enormity of it is something that I'm, I'm still trying to, I guess there's still this human part of me that has trouble letting go of control and trouble surrendering to the enormity of what's before us. So I'll stop there. Mm. Yes, thank you so mm. much. Really, really thank privileged you, to be in all your presence. Thank you so much. That's, um, I think that really expresses well the kind of um, the difficulty with with healing and with transformation and the overwhelmingness of it all that you know as was expressed by Bridget as well and just it just seems so big yeah and um, and it's scary it's really scary it's frightening you know because we don't have control of anything. But the promise of control that we get is uh, in modernity is quite um, um, tempting, I guess, kind of um, easy to grasp at. Yeah. But yes, your presence being, I think, really the most important thing is the presence that you bring to the world, you know, your presence and your authenticity and your truth your solidarity with others. This is all, all we can bring. And that has a huge effect, I would say, on the world. The ripple effect of that is, is, is enormous. And their potential in every moment that because we live in this chaotic, complex, emergent system, there's always that potential. And you never know when some sort of phase shift will happen. You know, the changes, the transformations are not, are not linear. They don't necessarily have to build up over a certain time and you get 1% one year and 2% the next year. It, could, it can all happen very fast. And, and um, yeah, by being that change you want to see in the world, the cliche is it's just true. You know, that's all we can do, be the change. Thank you everyone for coming to this session. Yes, perhaps it can happen in no time at all. Mm. <laughs> what is time anyway? Yeah, I love that, that idea of thick now, sticky now. Mm. 
Yeah, and somebody, uh, yeah, again, going back to nature, I think for me, that's one of the places where I can really feel how the, the this construct of modernity about the linearity of time just peels off. When I'm looking at natural phenomena, it's just like, yeah, wait, wait, there's no linearity anymore. Um, mm. That or, mm. or um, breakout rooms. <laughs> It's no linearity yeah. <laughs> of time there either. Hmm. Was that one minute? No. <laughs> I, I want to contribute what we uh, spoke about in one of the small groups with Michelle. Um, I said that in when I gave birth or around the time that I had that very beautiful and clear experience of healing as healing the transgenerational trauma, whatever that might be, but uh, that that I that there was a healing of past and future at the same time, and that was a, a bodily experience. That was a knowing. It was a certainty in in my body in a way. That was just mm -hmm. really amazing, and and this is the wisdom, or this is the knowing which is missing. We have no language for in our public life, but. Mm. You know, and I remember Paul Hawken uh, said that, I guess, uh, when you ask the women and the children, they know what's needed for uh, healing this earth or something. And, and I'm oh really convinced that, that, you know, beyond all the decolonization and beyond all the indigenization, we really need to go so far back to where this happened, where this voice, where this knowing got drowned out and demonized. And, and they're looking down to earth and, you know, down to emotion, mm. down to, fem to the feminine, to the women and to the body and looking up to the sky and the mind and the male and this God up there, sort of you know, where that actually happened, mm. you know, so that's, that's what I felt in my, I guess, transformation or my experience that, that yeah. is really this, you know, and we talk about here about the embodied activism. It's really about that. You know, that we go to the body, which involves feeling the earth cry and it involves a lot of pain to, to actually experience as well. And, and that's why we're not going forward very quick because no one rushes to, to feel this pain. <laughs> yeah. So thanks again, everyone. Yeah. Beautiful, enriching. Thank you. I just wanted to just resonate off with what you said, and and that is that um, it's not a coincidence that uh, indigenous cultures are, uh, cultures are, are matriarchal. So it's it's very much the same thing. To we need to bring back the divine feminine. We need to rematriate the world, and um, this is very much part of. Of, of decolonization and indigenous perspectives. And um, that's one of the worst crimes of, of modernity is the destruction of the divine feminine, without doubt. Thank you all. It's been a pleasure and a joy to be in your presence. Thank you. Go well, and may you grow in wisdom. Thank you, Yin. Thank for you. All Thank you, you do. You too. Thank you. Thank you. Wilder and wilder in wisdom. And deeper yeah. and down. <laughs> Delve into the under. Underworld, yes. Into the roots. <laughs> wow. See ya. Bye. Thank you for the link, Brigitte. Thanks. <laughs>